This is another episode of Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. And now the architects, Doug Pat and Stephen Chung. You are watching or listening to the Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. That is Doug. Good morning, Doug. Good morning. Good to see you, Stephen. You're looking a little tan from your vacation. I've been on vacation. I think they actually the vacation uh, gave me a thought about uh, today's topic. And I know you were on vacation a week before. And it has to do with inspiration. We talked about creativity last time and kind of want to talk about inspiration because I find this week away, um, typically a week in the summer for me, uh, usually it's in August, but this year we a little earlier. Uh, I find that week actually where I, I do get inspired. Um, it's, it's, it's about getting away from all the kind of responsibilities and things that have to be done um, with, all that, with all that pressure kind of gone. I don't know, I somehow get re-inspired to do something and I, I don't know it's always designed something but but um, and where I go in Maine uh, there's no internet there's no phone it's it's just I mean actually for the first day it's a little stressful and disconcerting but after I just say I'm disconnected what can I do it's over <laughs> um, I can able I can able sort of relax and 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 seek out inspiration I guess so let's like talk about inspiration how about that sounds great man I'm ready okay you go first then so uh, my first tip uh, relative to you know our audience and designing your dream home um, has to do with the place that I uh, just vacationed. So I was on the uh, along the east coast in the uh, on the New Jersey shore, and uh, we visit uh, a place called Stone Harbor and Avalon. It's a very very nice location. We've been going there for decades. Uh, but just to the south of that, right above Cape May is a place called Wildwood, New Jersey. They've got a famous boardwalk there. And there is some really super cool architecture down there. So my first tip would be, uh, you know, relative to designing something and then, you know, vacationing, get down to Wildwood, New Jersey, if you have never been there before. Um, there's some really neat architecture. So you guys may be familiar with the term uh, googie, or the Googie movement in architecture uh, that has to do with modernist architecture from in between the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, mostly out on the West Coast, but on the East Coast here, uh, we saw some of that as well. And in Wildwood, New Jersey, there are some really cool 1950s and 60s uh, retro motels. And these things are all along the uh, coast and they're absolutely spectacular. Um, so, uh, I was doing a little research for this and I came across a guy named Darren Bradley. He's got an Instagram account called, uh, mod architecture. I would definitely check that out. Now he photographs modern modernist architecture and, uh, this falls into, uh, that genre. He also has a Flickr account called Shimei Blue and that's spelled B-L-E-U-E. -E. Anyway, check that out. Uh, in terms of seeing some of these pieces of architecture, of course, if you can't get to Wildwood, New Jersey. But so, um, you know, let me kind of set the scene and hopefully we'll have some pictures here. But you, you've got hotels called like the Caribbean. They have these gigantic neon signs, you know, just like you dream you see out in the 1950s on the West Coast. Um, these sweeping semicircular concrete slab walkways and massive signs made out of neon. Everything's got a flat roof. What is incredible and almost nauseating is these fake palm trees. These places have one palm tree after another, and they they're gigantic. You know, they come big and small, and they're completely fake. I mean, they're made out of plastic. They're awful, and they are everywhere, but the architecture is super cool. So lots of minimal details, uh, massive concrete piers, shapely facades. Uh, the signs are amazing. So there's a hotel called the Panoramic Hotel. Really, really beautiful. Almost stuff that you'd see like a Brady Bunch like uh, signage, uh, graphic design stuff, um, but just really neat things and uh, neat pieces of architecture. And so it takes modernism, which I love and I know you do too, and it kind of blows it out of proportion with lots of interesting and, and ugly colors and these beautiful <laughs> symmetries and regularities with the facades. 
lots of kitschy stuff, but definitely something, uh, it's a sight to see. So go online and check it out. And you ever get down there, it's really beautiful. And it's like literally one block after another of these hotels, wow. which have been, uh, which have been maintained. And apparently they've lost a lot of theirs, 1950s and 60s architecture too. People just don't understand what the value of this stuff is anymore because, um, you know, they find it, uh, ugly and difficult to renovate. And so they tear it down and they build something that's a lot more accommodating to people's taste today. But anyway, check it out. Uh, wow. This is Wildwood, New Jersey. Anyway, they call it the Doo-Wop Motel District. They don't call it the Googie Movement there. They call it doo which is, again, a ridiculous name. But uh, that's how you'll find it online. Wow, I never even heard of that. So yeah. that's something I have to check out. Um, Very cool. Interesting. Very inspiring. Okay. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting because, um, you, you know, I, as I say, we, we go to Maine every, every summer. And um, <laughs> And what we've been doing is because, you know, you think, oh, we go to the wilderness, you go to like, uh, you know, Acadia National Park and people like camping and hiking. And I mean, I, I do like that, the hiking part of it, but uh, the camping, I can't really do camping. I can do camping in a nice house <laughs> in the woods, but I, I, I just somehow I, I can't do that. I can't do the real rough, the rough stuff. So uh, I'm staying in tennis rough. But anyway, so I need to be comfortable. I know I'm, I'm a little soft, but um so what we do every year is we go to an Airbnb type of site. It's not always Airbnb, but it's a type of site. And I find architect design houses. And um, so this year we found a house designed by Toshiko Mori. She's a very good Japanese-American architect, former chair at Harvard, um, known for her minimalist, uh, lots of glass, uh, kind of metal boxes, if you will. She does a lot of museums and, and that sort of thing. So we found a house that she... Uh, I guess the, the the client is renting out, so you can rent a house per week, and it wasn't super cheap, but it wasn't super expensive either because you know we go pretty far north in Maine, um, and it was awesome. It, it's just amazing to be able to um, spend a week in the design of you know someone someone who is a very talented designer, uh, beautiful site, just really well put together, and you know it's a lot. It's different than going to a museum where you or a building and you kind of take a bunch of pictures, you just spend half an hour there or whatever it is and you leave. You live with a house for a week in its natural setting. Um, it's it's really exciting. I mean, I find it really inspirational. I have to say that I, I actually, after a couple of days, I really start nitpicking and finding all kinds of things that I think are wrong with <laughs> it and messed great. up, but, but, or things that I would do or it could be improved or what have you. But it's only that the house is inciting you to sort of think and engaging you because it's just been done so well. I mean. And I, I, I brought my drone up there. I took some, you know, different main shots, but also the house and, you know, kind of did some fly arounds and I'll have them here. Sweet. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's and just to explain, I mean, it's a rocky coast. There's no one around. It's empty. It's, there's no other houses that you can't see them. It's a glass house facing the water. So it's not so hard, you know, as a, as a starting point. Let's have a lot of glass facing the water, a rocky coast, no boats, nothing, empty. Um, and uh, how do we accommodate a couple of bedrooms, a couple of bathrooms and make it comfortable? So it's not that hard, honestly, for me, if you get a site like that and, 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 uh, and a setting like that and obviously a decent budget, um, it's, it's not too hard, I think, in a way. But at the same time, to really do something really well, um, it really, to me, activates my imagination um, because I'm just looking around, looking at this site um, and, and inspired by the work of this architect, inspired by this site. And, um, and then later on, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking at lots of houses, have similar settings and, and sort of just inspired by just being in that place for a week. Again, uh, when architecture is done really well in concert with its setting, somehow that just gets me uh, real, um, you know, excited. And and I have to say also the the you know, that combined with the fact that I didn't have internet access and no phone and no one could call me or bother me, I really had to kind of leave all that behind. And, and at that point, your mind is sort of free to imagine. And um, I would say that in terms of, um, you know, trying to find inspiration for someone who out there is looking for inspiration. I mean, really unplug. Sometimes it's not great to be constantly looking at Pinterest and Facebook to try to get ideas or, or hows or whatever the site that you go to. Um, sometimes it's better to unplug and just kind of be free, just have, you know, be free with your own thoughts and be in a place that's beautiful and, and to sort of collect your your thoughts. And, and that's the case with me. So I, I always forget that. But when I go out there, it takes a day to sort of, oh my God, I'm on my phone. And, and then after a day or two and no one can bother me and I can't bother anyone else. And then I can really start to sort of think and, and, and be creative. So that's my, my first tip. Take a trip. 
Take a trip. Detach. Sounds Detach. great, man. I can't wait to see the drone images. Okay. What is your second tip? Okay, so, so this is going to sound really corny, but I believe that the ocean really kind of puts things in perspective. So just like you're saying, you know, you got to detach and get away and, you know, just stop being inundated by all this stuff. Standing out and look at the ocean, to me, is a very powerful experience. I mean, the, the ocean's gigantic, right? It's stunning, it's powerful, and it's incredibly humbling because of its size. So I feel like it kind of puts things in perspective and it puts things into place. So, you know, not everybody's gonna have a home at the beach and they're gonna be able to either build close to the beach or be able to look out on the beach. But I would I would add to what you were saying is get out and take a look at the ocean and think about the work that you're currently doing and how it's affected by your point of view, right? So I'll, I'll tell a little story in a second here. So as an architect, I think, and as a high-end residential architect, I think about the work that I do and the people that I work for. And many times you get caught up with this idea that, you know, it's, it's really important the work that I'm doing and I and I hope someday that I'm recognized for the work and I'm appreciated. Maybe it'll get published and I hope they really enjoy living there. But the bottom line is everything is essentially meaningless. And let me explain why. So, you know, one of the things that really put um, my career into perspective was something that happened, I, let's say it was about... Um, uh, 13 or 14 years ago, uh, Joe Moore and I were working for a client in Connecticut, uh, uh, a very large property, about 11 acres, was up on a hill, um, and uh, it was a custom home. We worked with the client for about uh, three, three and a half years on this wow. job, and uh, what, uh, the client was wonderful, husband and wife, they had two kids, uh, and the project really went beautifully. We worked very closely with the wife in particular, but you know, we had site meetings and we met both of them on a weekly basis. Uh, this thing was uh, highly uh, designed and, and detailed. It was a wonderful project. We finished the thing and within a couple of weeks, the clients got divorced. I mean, you think about that. And not only did, did they get divorced, but they both left the property. So this house that we spent, you know, almost three and a half, four years working on with them, designing f for them. I mean, it wasn't just like, you know, building and des designing and building a home. It was their house and they walked away from it and, you know, really put things in perspective for me because what I do is temporal. You know, I'm going to design something for somebody and hopefully they enjoy it, but eventually they're going to move or they're going to die or they're gonna sell it, you know, something's gonna happen and somebody else, and somebody eventually did move into that house, but what's gonna happen in 10 or 15 years, especially in that neck of the woods or 20 or 30, somebody's gonna rip it down and build a new house. So what I do isn't really that important. I mean, let's put it into perspective. So, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to putting things in perspective, I think the ocean really kind of does it for me. It makes me feel more creative and it really does put everything that I do and am into perspective. So wow, that's yeah. a partly partly depressing story, Doug. <laughs> yes, it is. It is, and you know, we actually had another client. I I didn't work on this project. Uh, we had another client pass away during the construction of one of our jobs uh, right. due to a an awful accident that happened. So you know, it 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 it's temporal. You know, life is is temporary. And you never really know what's coming around the corner. So it is very depressing. But I, I think everybody needs to put these things in perspective because it's really not that important when you're screaming, which I used to do when you're screaming at the contractor about a problem and you know it's their fault and you know that you can really dig into them. You got to you got to knock it off. You got to put it in perspective, you know. And so as an older guy, I. I can step back and look at who I was in my career and how I've done what I've done over these years and I can put it in perspective. I wish I would have had that perspective as a younger guy. And I, and we all know that um, uh, architectural projects are challenging. And when you go through this process, if you're gonna be working on your own house, it's gonna be really stressful. So try to keep things in perspective. Tip yeah, I have to mention that, that it's happened not exactly that, but certainly you know any project, um, you go through half of it and it's, everything's going great. And just like you say, they, 
they get divorced or or something changes in the family someone passes away or suddenly the kid needs some special attention they the, the vacation house doesn't seem to make much sense i mean all these kind of things certainly yeah. affect any project so to me until the thing is you know someone opens the door and walks in uh it's really i i don't i never really get too high or too low i just kind of just sort of wait and people think aren't you excited i'm like you know we'll see how it goes it's a, it's a long <laughs> right. haul. good long idea haul. No, I like to comment with the ocean, Doug. So this is my comment with the ocean because I was thinking about this. Yeah. Uh, every day after our hiking, um, we had a dock at the house that we rented. Um, my feet were really tired, and especially I have a plantar fasciitis anyway. So my, my foot is always Ooh, throbbing at the end of the day. The water is like 50 degrees. So what I would do is I would go to the dock, and I would put my, sh my foot in the water, the freezing water. And after about 10 minutes, my foot was completely frozen and numbed, which made me feel great. And like you, I would sort of look off into the distance while this was happening. And then, instead of having great ideas, I would always think that a shark was going to bite my foot off. <laughs> and I, would, <laughs> I would let my foot out of the water quickly. I don't know why that happens. I, it, it just city guy in the nature or suburban guy that goes off in nature and thinks there must be a shark on this dock or I don't know what. Every single time. That's funny. That's kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tip number two, and it's funny because we're on the same uh, wavelength because I think both of us are traveling and it's, it's sort of a quieter time, especially for residential clients. A lot of residential clients during August or July, they're just kind of, they check out. So it's a little, it's a little slower sometimes. Um, I can't help, uh, but again, go back to Maine, but pick up these little real estate sheets and they have them published. It's not like I'm on Zillow because I have no website, right? But I pick up these little sheets and it's like $39,000 for seven acres on this you know, land. I think, oh my God, what would I do with that? And I, I create these imaginary projects. Okay, I, I, I just, uh, what if I bought that piece of land and I don't have a lot of money, I would build like a little cabin. What would I do with that cabin? And so it's in my mind. It's not like I'm always writing every single thing down, but it's like a little design project that it's just like exercise. It's like my mind is kind of working out. It's like, what would I do? Okay, if I wanted to spend, let's say, $100,000 in construction for a little two bedroom cabin, what would I make it out of? And then, you know, because you're exploring the region, you're sort of seeing shingles and you're seeing these pitched roofs because of the snow. The incredible cold, so they you know they do certain things because they're on a let's say a, a floodplain. They lift the building off the ground on stilts, or or they you know they have a lot of screens because the mosquitoes are so fierce. But you basically start to look at that environment and start to understand why people do things the way they do. The vernacular, you sort of see, wow, why do they do that? Because they know that cedar can that wood can last in this kind of salty, humid environment, for example. Or, you know, the breezes are so cold from this direction. That's why everyone turns their back and makes the house this way. And so I, just the course of the week, I'm sort of scribbling these little concepts, but I'm really trying to learn from, as if it's a crash course, but it's a kind of exciting. Like when you're yeah. looking around, you're kind of looking for ideas. You're like, oh, look at that. Oh, wow. That's why they do that door like that. Interesting. And and so you just get in this, I don't know, I just get in this little thing. I'm just playing. I mean, it's just like, I'm. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's a sport analogy. I'm just kind of shooting baskets or something, just kind of working out, having fun and relaxing. There's no real project. There's no real deadline. It's just something that I do as, as, as a kind of a workout. Like, you know, now in my mind, I'm imagining what I would do in that $39,000 $39, five-acre lot with a little tiny little two-bedroom. It's, it's just in my mind. I'm sort of playing with it, and it'll never happen, I guess. But I just I just like that that process of, of just giving myself a, like a little exercise and, and just working out. I, I find that kind of fun. Um, I, don't, I, I guess it inspired me. I don't know if it's inspiring. It's more that it, it's, it's just a kind of fun exercise that gets my mind kind of activated and energized just by trying to imagine what I would do for myself. Uh, if we were to, you know, come back next year and, and buy this little piece of property, I was going to build like a little cabin. What would I do? Yeah. Um, I find that, I find that real fun, real inspirational. Very cool. Yeah, I'm going to build on that for my third tip, actually. Okay. Um, so what you're talking about is, at least in part, is is learning from the architecture or learning from the site, right? I mean, you're looking around at what, why do things look the way they do? And then while you're thinking about doing something for yourself, you're building on you know, all of these little pieces of, of knowledge that you're gathering. So l let me add to that uh, and and reference my last tip, which has to do uh, with the ocean. My tip would be architects use uh, location to design. So that informs the architecture. And we talked about this last week. So in specific, 
I was trying to think about architecture that's striking to me uh, that was informed by the ocean. And the project that comes to mind uh, is Louis Kahn's uh, Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. So uh, Jonas Salk uh, discovered the cure uh, for the once incurable polio. And so that he was he was the one who founded the Salk Institute and they do some really interesting work out there and it's still active. And so I'd encourage you guys to go online and take a look at uh, some of the pieces of architecture. But what's remarkable about that architecture is the, di the dichotomies in uh, materials and its setting and its position toward the ocean. So you've got these um, this series of linear buildings, one next to the other, which sit perpendicular uh, to the Pacific Ocean. And you have this very large courtyard in the center, which focuses out on the ocean. And everything there is made out of concrete. So it's this brutalist piece of architecture. And yet what's so striking about it is inlaid inside of all of these concrete rectilinear forms is this uh, beautiful wood and these wonderful wood patterns, which juxtaposed with that concrete are really quite wonderful because the two materials are so different. And then as you stand there and look out on the ocean, you've got this blue water, which is really the third material in my mind in this project. And so uh, Khan, who loved geometry, uh, really learned, I think, learned from and responded to that piece of property and that site with that piece of architecture. He really could have done just about anything there. And what he has done is he framed a really wonderful view and he thought about how could the materials accentuate what's already there, which is mm -hmm. this wonderful, spectacular view of the ocean. The second building I, I, th I think about in terms of architecture relating to the ocean uh, is the Sydney Opera House. Not many people talk about this building anymore, but Jörn, uh, Jörn Ertzen uh, designed this building, and it was apparently a sideshow uh, to put together. I did a little research about it at one point for my fact detector uh, project on Instagram. It took about 14 years to complete this piece of architecture, uh, but what was important to Utsun uh, was how it responded to the site. And so this is one of the first buildings that I can think of where a piece of architecture reflects what's out on the ocean, which are all of these wonderful sailing ships. And so you've got all these great pieces of concrete that look like shells and they look like ships sails. And what's remarkable about the architecture, one, as I said, it took so long to build, but Utsun, I don't think really knew how these things were going to be built. And so they had a, a great deal of difficulty structurally engineering all these pieces of concrete. I mean, they're massive and they're set one inside of the other and in all of these wonderful forms and shapes. And you, stay, you step back and, and look at this building and it's, it's uh, severe and it's wonderful and it's striking and you almost get it right away. And so, you know, when we're in architecture school, when students are in architecture school, you're always taught to take this idea and turn it in to architecture. And that's exactly what Utsun did with this building. And he really persevered because it took a long time. They had all kinds of uh, challenges with, uh, as I said, there were structural issues and there were budget issues, there were political issues, and it still eventually got built. So I'd, I advise you uh, to allow the site in some way to inform the architecture, and that can be an idea or a theme. Uh, something as simple as a ship's sail can can uh, inspire architects to make wonderful things. Uh, so anyway, that's my uh, third tip about um, design. Okay, my my third tip is uh, something that's going on right now because I, I've got a, well, say a potential client that wants to do a brownstone in a renovated brownstone in Brooklyn, and. You know, we had an initial phone call, and it's apparent to me that they're very knowledgeable. Um, <laughs> they they went so far as to take two classes on how to redesign your uh, your brownstone. So I, I feel like in some ways they know more than me. But um, but but I appreciate how how um, invested they are in this project. They just they are very um, they're really into it. I mean, and I I, I don't you know I, I appreciate that because you know it's a huge investment for them. They love design. They love architecture. Um, I think that they will still need to work with an architect, but I think that they they just really want this. They they enjoy this process. And it's a, it's a boyfriend girlfriend, a little older, but the, uh, not married. But they're together. This is like their project and a kind of a, a you know what they're going to do together. I guess before they get married. So I think it's kind of neat. 
Um, so for, for me, it has something to do with um, going one step beyond to try to understand uh, something. And in this case, they took a class. I think, for example, in the summer, um, even as even going to a school of architecture, which are typically open, if you go to a school of architecture, at the end of the year, there is an exhibit of the best work from the students, um, all different grades. And there's always a big gallery show and it's open. You can call any, I don't know what town you live in, but you can basically say, hey, I'm in Boston. I want to go visit Rhode Island School of Design, Harvard, MIT, and you know, gallery hours are open, normal hours. You feel free to come and you can basically just walk around in this exhibition space and see really what what kids are doing. It's it's kids, you know, young people are doing it. And it's the best that the school has to do, uh, has to offer. And what I find always so neat is that these kids are really pushing the boundary. And for someone who, I don't know, looking for ideas or, or want to be inspired, you go into a place like this and you see what a young 22 year old is sort of thinking about yeah. and imagining. Uh, led by a really distinguished critic or professor, you see some really amazing things. And, and I go one step beyond that. Um, and uh, you know, let's say you walk through the gallery exhibition. You you know you you sort of there's somebody there and you say, hey, listen, you know, I, I I think this is really cool. Can I come by during the year and stop by uh, during one of the reviews, like a, a final review? And, and you can. I mean, it's public. You can just ask and say, when when is the final reviews? And say, well, it's you know at the end of the semester. But, the, you know, the big gallery is going to be held here. The big review will be held in this space. So come on down. It's between, you know, two and six on December 20th. And if you really engage and you want to you want to just sort of see more and see it in action, you can come. So you can come to a school and just sort of sit on the sidelines and watch. And it, what's so cool is when you see the same design project um, that's being assigned to 15 students, that means 15 different people yeah. are taking it on 15 different ways. And so imagine, you know, uh, you're looking at a design project and you're like, God, there's only one or two ways to go with that. No, there's 15 different guys coming at it from different directions. And it's so awesome to see that, to sort of see the different ways that someone can tackle the same problem. And, um, you know, it, it's no surprise that I think critics or teachers learn as much from students as the other way around because this, the, the teacher is really seeing how 15 different imagination, uh, you know, sort of imaginative minds are sort of undertaking a design problem. So I think if you really want to engage and sort of take that next step and be inspired, visit a school of architecture and and either see the end of the end of the year show or one step beyond that, you know, take in a review. You'll find it really fascinating. Um, and it, as I say, it's open, it's public. Um, you can always visit um, for the most part, you know, without any concern, you can come sit in the background. There's always a kind of a you know, a lot of chairs and you can sort of sit in the back or sit in the front wherever you want and just watch. I find that really uh, inspiring. And now that I'm not teaching at this moment, um, I do on occasion visit a school of architecture and just kind of sit on the sideline. And sometimes someone recognizes me and say, hey, do you want to? I said, I'm not really. <laughs> just, I'm just watching. It's just uh, like taking a little league game. Just come, you know, pull up and watch the game for a couple innings and take off. It's, I find that really enjoyable just to kind of be in that environment and see all these intense kids so oh, taking on these design problems and uh, building all these crazy models and drawings, and I find that really inspirational as well. Like maybe it has something to do with sort of going backwards in time and sort of uh, as a yeah. young person and and seeing that in action again. So um, take in a, a visit a school, visit, visit a school of architecture near you. Great piece of advice. I would not have thought about that or haven't thought about it in a long time. Very cool. So Doug, at this point, um, want to wrap up our our uh, three tips on inspiration. Um, yes. Um, and normally what we do at this time is answer a reader question. We do not have a reader question this week because of the vacation. However, yes. I do have a question for you. You do? Yes. All right. Give it this, to me. This comes from uh, Stephen Chung. And uh, <laughs> I, I have a, a basement, Doug, that has uh, old tiles, BCT tiles, that have asbestos. Oh. And... Um, okay. The problem is unearthing them or taking them out. That's when the asbestos is released. I think the better idea is to cover them. Yeah. And I'm thinking of some sort of covering for a basement. So let's say someone has a similar issue with a basement. They've got a basement problem. They have this asbestos tiles. It's incredibly expensive to take them up um, as well because you need a certain kind of license. You need a certain kind of crew. It's you know hazardous. What I've heard is that you can actually cover it. And I'm thinking about pouring an epoxy or a level elastic or Ooh. something like that. Do you have any experience with that, Doug? Please help, Stephen. Sign Stephen Chung. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> I think I think you've asked me the one question I have no experience answering. Really? Um, but I will take a shot at it okay. anyway. 
because I'm doing some work at my house right okay. now, <laughs> uh, where I've got an outdoor porch, uh, which is sinking very slowly uh, over time. <laughs> and over the course of 15 years, it's probably sunk about three quarters of an inch in one corner. And it's okay. so they built, they put all this brick uh, on the porch and uh, it's cracking everywhere. And so water's coming in and we've got all kinds of issues. Anyway, the reason I'm, I'm talking about it is I had a contractor out here and we're going to, I think we're going to underpin the thing okay. and to stop it from moving. And then we're going to pour a concrete slab on top of the existing bluestone uh, patio because it's enclosed. And then we're going to uh, insulate the interior. And we're going to use it as a four season room. So my thinking there would be, you know, we're considering pouring this slab to not only uh, give us a level, um, uh, uh, a level, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? A level patio, a level, you know, space out there because it's pitched about a quarter inch to the foot right now because mm -hmm. it was exterior. Uh, so we're going to get a level surface and we're going to uh, add some framing to it. Anyway, that's what I would recommend. So this epoxy idea is interesting. I'm not sure what the minimum amount of concrete is that you've got to pour before it's stable, right? And before, and, yeah. and what kind of um, uh, what kind of reinforcing you're going to get into a super thin like rat slab, you know, a two inch slab out there. Uh, so my concern with pouring concrete, so yes, number one, I think covering it is the right thing to do. I would definitely talk to my local code official about that because I'd want to make sure when I go to sell the house, if anybody knew that there was uh, asbestos out there or downstairs, yeah. that it was something you know that you have discussed and worked through. Uh, and then I would think about pouring something over it. So I like the epoxy floor idea. You could find out what the minimums are on that before uh, it works and it's not gonna crack for you. And yeah. I do the same thing with, a, I get a mason out there and I talk to him about uh, pouring a concrete slab and doing the same kind of thing uh, to get you a good level surface that you can then work on. So and, that's know, my that's my advice. My house is new, but the, I built a new house on top of an existing foundation to sort of save money. Um, and it, you know, this so this these issues and you because you have renovated your house. Um, this whole issue of renovation and someone asks me how much it's going to cost. I have no idea because this happens all the time. You 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 get an yeah. existing house and and I'm like I can't see what's in the floors, what's in the walls, what's underneath right. the basement. I have no idea and inevitably it, it never fails we start opening things up oh my god there's like right. you know a hamster house up there yes. and there's like there's like you know radon gas underneath this thing and back <laughs> in the old days you know they didn't do this that way that tree root is now pushing through this and that yeah and it and it's, it's it always is this way so yeah it's uh, i i kind of don't want to look look behind things or in my basement yeah. i don't want to see more things because i know that it's it's not going to be good so i'm just want to cover it up yeah, cover it up. I, I think <laughs> that'll work, up. right? Because these uh, old homes that have asbestos siding, yeah. I, I believe you leave it alone. You know, yeah. you don't start tearing it off. It's not a problem. I'm not sure what the rules are when it when it comes to covering it up, but I think you can yeah. uh, do that. So check with your local code official on that one. All right. Thank you, Doug, for the hey, <laughs> for your advice. Absolutely, buddy. So you've been watching or listening to Vacation Inspiration for Designing Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to next time.